Anytime. Up next, a review, the dueling game, card game, Sorcerer. Uh, Sorcerer was designed by Peter Schultz, uh, developed by Robert Dougherty and Darwin Castle. Features art from, and I'm going to apologize ahead of time because there's a bunch of names here that aren't English, and I, I do apologize. So we got Dan Dremovic, Alina Kubakawa, Vasek Panasic, Peter Schultz, and Pavel Sorosic. It was kickstarted in 2019 and published the same year by White Wizard Games. Now, I first got to try this game at Origins 2019, where Rob Dougherty himself taught me how to play. By the end of the weekend, I convinced him to send me home with a review copy of the base game. No other compensation was provided. Now, the best way to see what you get in the Sorcerer Core Set is to watch our unboxing video on YouTube. For those of you who haven't seen it yet, though, what do you get in the box? All right, up first, a nice, thick, glossy rule book, lots of white space, nice, large font, tons of examples, no complaints at all about the rule book. It's exactly what I want from it. Uh, you're going to reference it a few times, but most of the rules are actually on the card. So it's not one I bring out that often, except for getting a couple of player powers. Great rule book. Uh, then we have some punch boards. These are mostly lots and lots of little counters and tokens for tracking things during the game. Uh, there's some nice dividers. It's worth noting the dividers are actually like punch boards or cardboard, not just thicker, taller cards. And then there's some standees to represent your characters, one of the board game elements in this game. Uh, while the art in this game is really top-notch, having standees is a bit of a letdown. I know they're already stretching the card game into a board game. I think if they throw miniatures in there, the, the dueling card game players might have thrown a fit. So <laughs> I'm not sure about that one. I, they're fine. They're not great, mm. but they're functional. Uh, next, we have four rather solid player boards. Uh, these are over top a nice plastic box insert. The insert itself has a ton of room for cards, like a ridiculous amount. Uh, you can see in the unboxing video, I take the cards that come in the game. They maybe take up 20% of this. So they're obviously expecting a bunch of ex uh, expansions to be coming out for this. There are some out as well. Uh, in that, I found the rest of the stuff. There were some location tiles, the dice, some cubes, and some glass bead style counters. Now, the location tiles on the player boards are worth noting because they're two-sided. Uh, one side having a generic occult theme and the other having an Egyptian theme. The player boards also have the mana boards flipped, the opposite sides on these. So from what I understand, I'm not left-handed, but this is a great thing for left-handed players to stop you from bumping your, your energy track. It called it mana, it's energy. Um, there's also four location tiles, three being in Victorian London, the other being some weird, messed up demon place. I don't know what it's supposed to represent. Looks kind of neat. Uh, all these are mounted boards in significant thickness. Uh, is probably the best way to word it. You can, again, see it in the unboxing video. I was actually very surprised by how thick and, like, solid, and they're not going to bend, like how nice these are. They're not just cardstock. The dice are worth mentioning. There's an oversized D8. That one's, it's a D8, big deal. But there are seven custom D6s. These include two blanks. A pentacle, one pentacle, two of uh, these skulls or demon heads. I can't quite tell which. I guess they're both skulls with horns. And then one side, there's two skulls. So you got blank, blank, pentacle, one skull, one skull, two skull. Finally, we get to the cards. This is a card game. So the cards are your main thing you want to see here. Cards are packaged in those nice, easy to open packs. And there are a lot of them. Not nearly enough to fill the box, but tons of them. There are three different types of cards in this game three different stacks of cards there are character cards lineage cards and domain cards and in the base game you get four different sets of each of these so four characters four lineages four domains information on the cards very clear easy to read uh one of the things i like is the special abilities are actually defined right on the cards so there's no glossary you need to look up while playing card quality is excellent what you'd expect from white wizard games if you played epic or star realms or any of their other games ascension they're all the same great quality yeah indeed there was no peering at or struggling to read anything on these cards the text text nicely popped though i'll note it is a light text on dark which yeah. we know is mo's favorite that's yeah, no it's it's not too bad on these ones it's better than trying to read a whole rule book with that <laughs> one card at a time it's not too bad now the one thing i do want to know here is the artwork well sorcerer has some fantastic artwork like really nice quality artwork this is not a happy friendly kids game uh, you're playing necromancers and demonologists and summoning hordes of terrible minions to do horrible things in Victorian London, and the artwork reflects this. The artwork is going to turn off some players, and is probably not something you want your kids to be subject to. 
But then should we ever subject our children to enact romances? I guess that's a decision that each family has to come to on their own. The other thing that's important to note is that this is not a collectible card game. This isn't you're going to go out and buy booster packs. Everyone who buys Sorcerer gets the same 12 decks of cards, all with the same cards in them. Now, the remaining bits, the counters and such, are all decent quality. There's nothing really I need to highlight here. No complaints. Uh, there's counters for tracking things, some standees, first player token, all that fun stuff. Nothing really all that important. Now, of course, there will be and already are many expansions for this in, you know, booster pack yep. size, both in cards and in locations, actually. But only one person yep. has to buy them. I would actually suggest that for a group, it might work well if one person buys the base or people chip in to buy the base and then other players can, you know, pick up uh, the odd expansion here or there, uh, pack here or there because they're relatively inexpensive. Yep. And though they are in boosters and not randomized again, you're going to buy one character or you're going to buy one domain or you're going to buy one lineage and get all the cards for that character domain or lineage in one pack. Again, no randomness. Now, a bit about the game. Sorcerer uh, is at its core a two-player dueling card game, right? And by that, I think most people know what I'm talking about, but I'm talking about many games that came before it. Ashes, uh summoner wars and of course magic the gathering being the big daddy the the elephant in the room uh first off players are going to build a deck now this is something that makes this game stick out because they're going to do that by picking one stack of cards from each of those three types so you're going to grab one character one lineage and one domain and again the base game comes with four of these so you got quite a few different options here they're then going to take the top cards off which are these skill cards they're going to take the rest of them and mash them together and shuffle them together to make your play deck so it's not really deck building in, in the, the board game term sense of it, as much as yeah. it you're drafting your from a set of options to pick the aspects that will eventually form your deck. Yeah, exactly. It makes perfect sense that way. Like, if anyone's played Smash Up before, they're going to be familiar with the take two decks, mash them together. Now each player is going to take a player board. They got a spot to place their deck, a discard pile, a uh, place to track your starting energy. I don't remember what you start at, sorry. A place to store omens you earn, which are little button things you're going to earn, and a way to track your number of actions. Uh, the actions and energy are used in those glass beads I mentioned earlier before. You're going to put three locations out between the players. What's on them doesn't matter. Like, the game comes with four. It doesn't actually matter which ones you use. That's a thematic thing. Plus, you can buy replacement ones for other locations. But again, there's no special rules on these. Uh, these are the battlegrounds you're going to fight over. So unlike Magic or Sky or Star, Star Realms or any of those other games... There is a board game element to this. You are trying to win by destroying two of the three battlegrounds that are in play. First player to destroy two of the three wins the game. Now, at the start of the game, you're going to get a hand of cards. There is a mulligan rule. I'm not going to bother mentioning that. You're going to get some starting energy, and you start with one Omen token. You randomize who goes first. You get a first player token. Uh, that's important because the first player token can be spent to reroll dice. Um, then you get into the main game. There are four phases. There's the ready phase, the action phase, the battle phase, the end phase. Um, ready phase is skip the first turn. Ready phase is your usual start of turn maintenance, untapping. Yes, it's not called untapping, whatever. You're going to swap first player, etc. Now, the important one here that's unique to this game, that like Ashes is another game where you derive your mana from your dice. Well, in this one, the player whose turn it is decides if everyone gets four energy or they can roll the D8, and that's what everyone gets. You're also going to decide what battleground your character's in. So like those three boards, you're going to put your standee for where your character is focused. Now, choosing your battleground is actually an interesting and important mechanic since certain aspects of the game can only take place where your character is actually yeah. present, even though all three battlegrounds can see action between minions each turn. Yeah, I mentioned those skill cards that you're going to take off your top of your deck. That's the main place this is going to come into play, is you can only use your skills, your character skills, where your character is, which actually makes sense thematically. So Again, I, I skipped over themes. So the theme of this is your necromancers, whatever, in Victorian London, trying to destroy Victorian London. Uh, you know, if to, to give it a sort of a magic, uh, you know, magic the gathering concept, it would be like if any of the creatures you cast can attack any three battlegrounds, but the actual sorcery spell cards that you're casting... Yeah can only be cast at one location because you are at that location. And that's yeah, sort of that's how, how it works comparison. compared to magic. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, the action phase, of course, is the big part of the game where players are going to put cards into play, gain energy, move your units around. Uh, there's a series of actions you can choose. Channel energy, really simple. You gain two energy, mana, whatever you want to call it. Meditate, draw two cards. Now, this is important. 
because unlike 90% of these games, you do not draw cards to refill your hand at the start of your turn or at the end of your turn. The only way to get more cards is to take the medicate, meditate action, or of course, this is an exception-based game, there may be cards that say draw more cards. All right, cast a spell. Spend energy to put a card in play. Every card has a cost at the top left. Now, what's interesting here compared to many of these games is there's no different types of mana or anything like that. If the card said it costs five, you spend five energy put into play. No worrying about land or different mana types. Activate a power. Some cards, including your character domain and lineage cards, have powers on them. You use these powers, you have to spend an action. Uh, reinforce. This one's important because there's different battlegrounds. When you play your minions, they each get played to a different battleground. Well, you may want to move them during the game. So use the reinforce action to move or swap minions around the board. Uh, you're generally limited to move from one that's adjacent, but then some units have flying. Uh, so you can jump to anywhere on the board. You just keep going back and forth until each player has taken six actions. So I'm sure many people will see some real and unsurprising similarities to Magic. Really, anyone who's got some time playing Magic or any dueling magical card game will be really comfortable playing this game. Next, we get to battle. So battles. Your battlefields are resolved one at a time. It's based on player order. I'm not going to get through that now. But you're basically going to go to whatever battlefield you're resolving. The active player is going to choose one of their minions to attack. When they do that, they tap the minion so it can only attack once and it can't be used for anything else. You're going to look at their powers. So similar to Magic, there's two stats with a slash, though they work very differently in this game. It's like a power and a defense in a way. You're going to look at the power. You're going to roll a die for every power. The omens I mentioned before, which are little counters, can be spent to re-roll dice. So there's your, your randomness mitigation. You spend one omen per die. Plus the first player token can be flipped to re-roll all your dice. Um... The order of who gets to re-roll first doesn't really matter at this point. I cover that in the full review. But the important thing is you're looking for those skulls or those pentacles. Damage is placed on a minion or a site, and you're going to place one damage for every skull, and you're going to place one damage for every pentacle, which are the crits. What's neat here is the skulls are assigned by the defender, whereas the crits are assigned by the attacker. So that's an important part of the play. Now, damage goes on a minion or a site. When a minion's damage hits its defense, that's that second number. I think it's called their spirit. Again, terms, all these card games have their own unique terms. It's removed from play. Once a site takes 12 damage, though, the team that caused the damage wins the site. You actually flip it over, and it shows a burning section of London now, or a burning demonic, whatever the heck that thing is. And that player now either needs one more site to win or just won the game, because it was the second one they claimed. You just attack back and forth until all the minions have attacked. Then you go to the next battlefield. You do it again. Uh, then there's the end of round section. This just exists because some card effects happen at the end of the round. Now, with this is your usual, this is a dueling card game. This is an exception-based game, which means those are the basic rules, and the cards are probably going to break those rules in some way. What I've listed above is the basic. Things are going to change based on one thing. So like each different lineage that you pick actually gives characters asymmetric powers and makes them completely unique so in the base game one of the characters can steal cards from the opponent and place them onto their minions as arthropod followers and they have all these bugs all over them which gives the cards with the arthropod followers a bonus power another character is a necromancer who can bring cards back to life and into play from their graveyard which is their discard pile so that's just an example of two of the characters and how they play differently yeah so so far from my play i found the game cards really suit the theme well uh at least in the base and uh you're not stretching to figure out how this relates to the concept i mean you know with magic for example they've been putting out so many cards for so long you sort of wonder what does this have to do with anything but uh they you know this is this is way more thematic and they haven't had to delve into planes travelers in order to uh justify all their concepts <laughs> At least so far, if the game's popular enough, they'll probably get there. Well, they are putting out a lot of expansions. They are. There, there were a lot, because it was Kickstarted, right? So there were already extra of the three main card types that, that people could have got right away. Yeah. And extra lands, and extra dice, and extra stuff. And then they're putting out more. And there's another Kickstarter, I think, coming for even more stuff. Um, so the game is designed for two players. Very obviously, it can be played with more. There are three and four player variants. You can play with just the core box. And technically, the game can go up to six players, but in that case, you've got to buy two starter sets or some of the expansion packs, just because, well, there's only four characters, four lineages, and four domains. So you buy one set more, now you can play up to five. You buy another set, you can play up to six. 
we'll talk more about player counts later. Overall, Sorcerer is an excellent two-player dueling card game that does some cool stuff I haven't really seen before. Uh, the first, though, is the first highlight, the first unique thing is that deck building system. I really like that. The pick three different decks and mash them together to make your play deck. Reminds me of Smash Up, as I mentioned. What I like about this is it's a good middle ground between games where you make your own deck from scratch, like Magic, where I just tend to get overwhelmed by the options, or the opposite hand, where games like Keyforge, where it's like, here's your deck, you're stuck with this. I like that I have some choice, that I, I get to manipulate it and I get to try different combos, but I don't have to be an expert deck builder to enjoy the game. Yeah, I think this is something that comes from the non-collectible nature of the game, while still wanting to be ex be able to expand the heck out of it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And, but it also adds to the replayability of the game because you can play it and you've got, even just with the base game, this, you know, nice number of selections. Um, I will say that it is actually in many ways sort of like Keyforge, but how they play Keyforge at the factory is Keyforge is actually, each deck is made up of three components. Right. Uh, which is similar to how this is, uh, but uh, unfortunately... But you don't get the pick three. No, no, I, well, that's what I mean. Keyforge is, is this is how they play Keyforge at the factory. Yeah. Because they're actually building those decks, those random decks. True. With three True. components uh, out there. See, Keyforge could have a totally different thing if you could just go out and buy the three separate different, pick three of your want and mash them together and yeah. the two games that work together. Fancy Flight should talk to White Wizard. I hope White Wizard copyrighted that. There you go. <laughs> uh, the next thing I really dig are the board game elements. Uh, they call this a hybrid board card game. I got to say, it still leans very heavily on the card side of things it's a card game with a board but there are elements the fact there are three location boards uh the big one sean talked about earlier where you have to decide where your character is each turn is a big ability and while the whole rolling dice thing obviously is very much a board game thing compared to a card game thing and i like of those i really like the rolling the dice for energy ger generation and the various dice based combat is cool especially because there's a way to mitigate it which is all about the omens it getting omens is actually fairly easy in the game and can really swing the tide of battle. Whoever has the most re-rolls wins often, which can be a big part of the game. And I like that you can mitigate how ran the randomness of the dice. Yeah, no, absolutely. The, the omens are a key. Knowing when to use them and when to hold them back can make or break decisions. Uh, and it's not just about targeting or defending, but deciding if your uh, power is going to be best used and where and which what minions might have emerged over here, or if you want to do something to make them think twice about bringing minions out to a yep. certain location. Now, I got to admit, at first, I was worried about the randomness of the combat system, but like we just talked about, many of the things I've seen over m multiple games is that it, it 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 balances out, right? Like the random factor over the bell curves tends to work out pretty good, and there's plenty of things that mitigate it. Uh, this varies from actual minion abilities. There are all kinds of minion abilities to let you roll extra dice or make people roll less dice. Attachments, which are kind of like the Magic the Gathering enhancements to give bonuses or penalties. And then, of course, the importance of omens. Um, while luck has been a factor in every game, I've never felt that I got screwed by the dice playing Sorcerer in any of the games i played. Like, sure, one turn or one battle, or uh, often the game will come down to one die roll and you fail in that one die roll. But over a full length of the game and multiple plays, dice have been just as much a bane and as a boon and tend to even out pretty much evenly. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I haven't seen any, um, you know... I, Yes, there's always the possibility that you could roll 41s in a row, but, you know, realistically, uh, I, you know, it doesn't seem to be an issue. And even if you do that one roll, it usually it's fixed by the next roll, right? Like, yeah, I got obliterated this round, but next round when I was attacking you, you're the one that rolled the ones. Yeah. So I don't know. It seems to, it seems to go out. So I got to admit, people who don't like randomness in their card games are not going to like that aspect. Magic the Gathering is definitely more deterministic. Yes, there's random factors with which cards you draw, but the combats are very much deterministic, whereas they are not in Sorcerer. Yeah. Now, most of what we've had to say has been very positive. Uh, despite all that praise, I got to say Sorcerer is not perfect. And the biggest failing it has is the fact that it's a two-player game. While there are rules for playing with more players, and I fully understand the folly of releasing a two-player game out in the board game industry in 2018 or later, uh, I in this case, they should have just stuck with two. While the four-player team-based game is okay, it's kind of fun, I really dislike the three-player version. And I got to say, every other person I played it with felt the same. Yeah, three-player was essentially broken. Four-player was two-player with teams. 
Free player left one person always sitting there bored or ignoring what was happening so they could play on their phone. Or, you know, the game just slogged. It was at its best slow and at worst utterly uninteresting. <laughs> it, it wasn't even a fun way to introduce someone new to the game as it's the worst example of how a fun game is played. Sure. Uh, the actual, even the actual turn resolution is overly complicated with yeah. three players just showing how hard they had to try to make a three-player variant work. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it just shouldn't. You shouldn't play a three-player. Uh, maybe there's people out there who enjoyed it, but definitely not us. Now, the other issues I saw with Sorcerer, there are enough of them, but that's just because it's a two-player dueling card game. And these are things that, to me, are evident in all of these. Uh, for one, the player that knows the game and knows the cards is probably going to beat the player that doesn't. This is true of all these games. That's what these games are about. It's all about system mastery, memorizing your decks, trimming down your decks, and knowing the combos. The first few plays of this game, too, players are going to be lost because all of a sudden you're given a can to seven cards and told, do something, and you're like, I don't know what to do with all these because I've never read them before. That's, again, true of every one of these two-player dueling card games, and that which also leads me to game length. When you got a new player and they have to read all the cards and they spend half the game saying, can you pass me that? Or oh, what's that guy's special ability? It can be a bit of a slog for the first time. Like, I'd, I'd say double the initial play time. Now, the true joy is, of course, discovering those card combos and taking advantage of them. And that is, I got to say, a skill. Not everyone is good at magic or that style of card game. There are people out there that I know are definitely good at it. It may not apply to some, or appeal to someone who likes heavy euros or doing the math, right? This is a very different way of thinking about playing a game. But again, these aren't sorcerer specific. These apply to other, all two-player dueling card games. Again, experience with magic or similar games will help, but nothing but reading the cards will teach you the actual cards in the game. Now, overall, I think it's pretty obvious, self-evident here. I really dig Sorcerer as a two-player game. Now, personally, I quit playing Magic the Gathering quite a long time ago, but this might be the game to convince someone else to get out of the collectible card game rut, especially that whole spending money on it. Anyone who's complaining about it. If you can afford to play Magic and you enjoy it, go for it. I'm not trying to cut up collectible card games, but I know they can be a money sink for people. And what I like here is you're looking at picking up one box and you're good to go. Like this, in my opinion, is one of the best modern two-player dueling card games on the market now. There are others I like. Ashes is still fantastic as well. But right now, this is the top of the market. This is pretty cool. Ashes is still good. Star Realms is still good. But right now, if I had to pick between those three games, I'd be reaching for Sorcerer. Well, despite having a rather horrible three-player experience with this game, it was, as we played it, an obvious flaw. So I do hope I can get the real experience an enjoyable yeah. experience of a two-player game sometime and get that bad taste out of my mouth <laughs> for what is a really solid thematic game. Now, I forgot you hadn't played two-player. It's, it's like, we got, again, we need an Excel file or something to <laughs> list. The, the board game menu, we'll put them all in and then it'll decide what you're going to play next time you're down. All right, for a more in-depth look at Sorcerer from White Wizard Games, check out Mo's written review over at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on Reviews. 